G'day everyone, my name's Matt and welcome back to The Fire Show. In this episode, we're going to start talking about some of the factors that affect bushfire behaviour. Now, bushfires are no different to any other fire where they still rely on a combination of heat, fuel, oxygen and a chemical reaction to actually sustain their combustion. But they actually have their own fire behaviour triangle as well, which consists of weather, topography and fuel. And in this episode, we're actually going to have a bit of a look at some of the factors that actually affect weather, topography and fuel and how they can actually work together. We're going to start off with fuel. When we're talking about bushfire fuels, there's many variables that we need to consider. We need to think about the overall amount of fuel that's present to burn, and we also need to think about the distribution of that fuel, because the distribution is a really important factor to how a fire will actually move through a landscape. We need to think about the amount of live versus dead material that's present within that area, and we also need to think about the overall fuel moisture content that's available within the fuel. Now we need to think about the fuel type and we also need to think about the fuel size because the fuel size will actually play a really important part to what will actually be consumed in the fire as the fire front passes through. So what we're going to do is run an experiment where we can actually see how the size of the fuel will actually really affect our fire's behaviour. Now first up we're going to start by burning some fine fuel which is generally accepted as fuel that is 6mm in diameter or less. Now the reason for this is fuel with a 6mm or less diameter actually has a very large surface to area ratio, which means that the amount of heat that we apply to the fuel can quickly heat that fuel up, get it to pyrolysize, and then allow it to catch on fire. Now that's different to our heavier fuel loads which we'll demonstrate in a minute. Now you can see here is what I've got is my fuel that's 6mm in diameter or less and I'm heating it over the top of a Bunsen burner. And quite quickly you can see that it's going to start heating up and then you're going to start to see those pyrolysis gases. And soon after that, you can actually start to see that there's some visible flame. Now, this happens quite quickly, and this is why we're actually looking at fuel that is six millimeters in diameter or less. And that's because this is the fuel that's consumed in the initial fire front. As the fire front passes through, it's those fuels that are six millimeters in diameter or less that actually get consumed by the fire. Now, bearing in mind, this is a rule of thumb and we just generally apply this to all fuels just because it's an easy way of describing the fuels that will be burnt in the fire front. Now you can quite clearly see that these fuels easily catch on fire. And when we compare that to heavier fuels, which are fuels that are more than six millimeters in diameter, they're much more resistant to catching on fire. And you can see that here, I've got a eucalyptus branch that I'm holding over the Bunsen burner and I can hold it over there for a much longer period of time before it starts to pyrolysize and then actually catch on fire. And this is because there's actually a lot more material that is there that can actually absorb the heat from the Bunsen burner, which slows the rate of heating for the branch. And therefore that chemical breakdown of the process of pyrolysis takes longer and more energy, and therefore it's more resistant to catching on fire. And this is why we actually see, as the fire front passes through, the lighter materials are consumed, where the heavier materials may catch on fire. However, they're going to burn for much longer than that initial fire front. And this is really important because if these heavier fuels are burning on the fire edge between the unburnt and the burnt, they can continue to burn until the fire weatherer has become bad again. And then the fire can start up and then run again, even though the fire may have died down in the days previous. Now for the next example, we're going to burn some live material and some dead material just to see how easily the two will actually combust. And what we've got is just some leaves from a gum tree and we're gonna hold them over the Bunsen burner. And as you can see, they're green and alive and I can hold them over the fire and straight away they do start to smoke. However, they do resist catching on fire. And this is really important because when a plant is green and healthy, it will actually resist catching on fire because it's got a lot of moisture in it. However, by comparison, if I actually hold some dead material over there, so some gum leaves that have actually dried out, you can see that they catch on fire much easier than they did before. And this is because the moisture content simply isn't there. There isn't anything to resist them catching on fire. And this is actually a really important component to how our fire is actually going to behave. The fuel moisture content plays a really important part to how a fire will move through a landscape. So the next aspect we're going to talk about is topography. Now, topography can affect a wide range of different variables depending on what's going on. In the southern hemisphere, we would generally expect the northern aspect slopes to be drier than the southern aspect slopes because the topography is actually shielding the southern slopes from the sun exposure. 
We can also see changes in wind where the topography can actually change the wind itself and we can actually see higher wind speeds and different wind directions depending on the actual topography in the given area. Now the topography can also affect the weather where we can actually see clouds start to form or we can see rain shadows as well as a result of the local topography. Now there's a whole range of different effects that topography can have but in this episode we're going to focus on slope and the effect slope has on the fire behaviour itself. So to demonstrate that what we're going to do is light a few fires and then put them at different angles. And you can see here in our first example the fire is burning on the flat and what's actually happening is the air is being drawn in from either side of the fire and the fire is very slowly moving across our experiment. And this is because the fire is actually relying mainly on radiation and conduction to actually spread the heat. Most of the heat is being lost through the convection current which is going straight up and away from our fuels. So the rate of spread across our flat surface is actually quite slow. And the way we can actually increase that rate of spread is by putting that fuel on a bit of an angle. And by putting that fuel on an angle what happens is we start to introduce more of that radiant heat to our fuel as well as that convection current is slowly getting closer to our fuel bird as well. So what we see is our fuel ahead of the fire is being heated up and as a result of that the fire can then start to spread faster throughout our fuel bed. So in our next example what we're doing is putting an even greater slope on it. And this is where things change quite a lot because as you can see the fire isn't going up anymore. The convection current is actually starting to follow the actual fuel bed. So this is really interesting because once we actually get to a certain slope there is a little bit more as far as fluid dynamics going on. Now to explain this what I'm going to do is just light a single fire and we can have a look at how it's actually drawing the air in. So as you can see here I'm lighting my single point of fuel and you can actually see that the flame is not only just going past where our fuel is but it's laying down and actually joining onto the landscape. And the reason for this is the way that the convection current is now working. On the side of the lower side of the slope there is a lot more air present than there is on the top side of the slope because the landscape itself is now actually blocking that air current. So what happens is the air on the left side of the picture overpowers the available air on the right because the topography is now getting in the way between the convection current and the fuel bed itself. So what happens is the air on the left side of the picture overpowers the air on the right side of the picture and then the convection current can simply lay down onto our fuel bed and the result of this is we can get a much greater rate of spread and this is the effect of topography. Now in some research being conducted by Jason Sharples from the University of New South Wales it's been demonstrated that this can occur at around about 26 degrees of slope which is a really interesting indicator when we're starting to talk about the effect of slope on fires. Now the effect of slope certainly isn't totally unknown to us. And some early work done by Alan MacArthur indicates that for every 10 degrees we increase our slope we can actually get a doubling in our speed of fire behaviour. So at 10 degrees it doubles and at 20 degrees it doubles again. But then at 26 degrees we can actually start to see that convection current lay over. And as a result we can possibly see rates of spread that are even faster than that again. Now the final variable we're going to talk about is weather and when we're talking about weather there are a lot of variables to talk about in relation to bushfire. Now some of those are atmospheric stability, temperature, humidity, soil dryness, drought factor and wind speed. So clearly right off the bat there's an awful lot we can talk about when it comes to weather but in this episode we're going to focus on the effect of wind. Now wind is a really important factor when we're talking about bushfire fighting because not only does it really affect our fire, it can also introduce other hazards such as falling branches and falling trees. And these can be really hazardous to firefighters. So when we're working in these areas, it's always really important that we keep our heads up and are always on the lookout for dangerous trees and dangerous branches and these kinds of things. Now, in relation to how the wind actually affects the fire itself, it actually affects it in a number of different ways. Because if we think back to our fire triangle, we have the heat, fuel and oxygen. And the wind actually provides extra oxygen to our fire because as the wind moves in, it's moving in with oxygen and therefore it can actually flare our fire up and provide it with more oxygen so it can burn more intensely. Now this is a really important factor because as the wind gets stronger, it comes with more oxygen and then the fire can free burn even better and better. Now this is also coupled with the fact that as our wind speed increases, our rate of spread also increases and this is because of the actual physical effect the wind has on our fire itself. As the wind is blowing it will actually push our convection current over 
in the direction of the unburnt fuel. And this is really important because now, instead of the heat going straight up in the convection current, what we're actually seeing is the convection current starts to lean over. And as it leans over, all of that heat is now being driven towards our unburnt fuel. Which means now the radiant heat, the convection current, and the conductive heat are all working together to actually preheat our fuel so that the fire can actually move through the fire bed even faster, which really increases our rate of spread. So wind is a really important factor when we're talking about bushfire behaviour because not only does it supply the fire with more oxygen so it can burn more effectively, it actually pushes the heat towards the unburnt fuel and therefore it allows the fire to actually spread faster than it would have otherwise done so. Now it also has the effect to actually blow embers ahead of the fire front. And we're going to talk about embers more thoroughly in a later episode, but they're actually a really important part to how a fire will actually spread across a landscape. Alright, so now we've seen that weather, topography and fuel are all really important factors when we're talking about bushfire behaviour. In the following episodes we're going to start to unpack these even further because there's an awful lot of information that can go with each one of these subjects. But that's it for this one, thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya!